chapter number 5 of the book of Revelation this morning. Now when people started asking me if we do a study on the end times, want to do it we'd be here for 19 years the rapture already happened and it wouldn't matter but if you'll remember we started dealing with the church in the end times today we're going to start with those that after the rapture has taken place will be left behind and they weren't left they just didn't have a ticket to go but if you go read chapter number four you'll get the best that the Apostle John could describe to us what he saw as he looked up and saw God sitting on his throne in glory, but the only problem is, is that he is restricted to words that you and I understand. That's the best that he could do, but it still don't do him justice. And we get to chapter number 5. It says, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within... And on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, who was worthy to open the book thereof. And no man in heaven, nor on earth, nor under the earth, nor were able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root. David had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb having every one of them harp and vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung in a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and, t- and people. Lead unto our God, kings and throne and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard, I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now in this passage, if you look hard enough, you're going to find a trinity. We just sang about him. Holy, 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 what do you think they're doing in this chapter? Same thing, different words. But there is a time, there's a problem. I may know a thing or two. I don't know everything. Study this book hard enough. Doesn't give you timelines for everything. That certain things have to happen before other things, but I don't know when them things are going to happen. We know that the Great Tribulation, which starts after the church is raptured out, is going to be seven years. The first three and a half are going to be people. The latter, God's going to pour out His judgment upon this world. But when it comes to opening the seven seals on this book, when it comes to seven trumpets being blown, I believe trumpets are going to be blown after seals are open, but I don't know what year the seals are going to start being popped off of that book. I don't know how long the judgment seat of Christ is going to be in the span of things, but with God, time is no longer a thing. Keep in mind, the Apostle Paul saw, I mean, the Apostle John, ain't the Apostle Paul, but we're not going there. The Apostle John saw things 
Go back to chapter number four. You're going to see that he heard a voice say, come up hither. And immediately I was in the spirit, he said. He's seeing things from a spiritual view. And he's doing his best to relay it to us to where we can understand it with carnal minds and carnal bodies. There are some things that God told him, hey, don't write that down. Keep that secret. There are some things that he saw and he's trying to make sense of just as much as we are. But the Lord said, record what you saw, and he record, recorded what he saw. Well, in this passage, the one sitting on the throne in glory, you might refer to him as God the Father, said he had a book in his right hand. That book, because of who holds it, that tells you its ownership and its authorship. That book was not influenced by man. It says that it was written in and it was written throughout, but it was also written on the backside. Kind of sounds to me like those uh, Ten Commandments that he originally carved with his finger, where it said that it was through, but it had something different on the front than it did on the back. What is this? This is a book that God himself penned. But who owns it? God owns it. But there's something about that from the beginning, I'm talking about in the beginning, God, I'm talking about in the alpha of time, somewhere past. God sealed this book with seven seals. God had requirements for what it would take to open this book that had seven seals on it. And the Apostle John said in verse number four that he wept much. Because as that strong angel stood up, I don't know what that strong angel is. Could be one of them cherubims that are the guardians of the throne of God. I don't know. But an angel stood up and proclaimed, who's worthy? That angel can't even touch the book. It's still in God's hand. But he says, who's worthy to open this book? John said he looked everywhere. And he couldn't find anybody. And because that book, there's something about that book that he... Right, it brought him to tears. He wept because the book could not be opened. There's something precious about what's in that book. Well then, verse number 5, one of the elders, now this is just them four and twenty elders, them twenty-four fellows that got thrones that are around the throne of God. That's the Old Testament, the patriarchs, and then the New Testament. That'd be the apostles. But wouldn't it just be like God? That is, John's up in the Spirit, seeing all these things foretold. One of these elders looks at him, says, Weep not. Behold, Jesus is coming. That's what he says. Told the apostle John to stop crying as he's seeing this, was actually the apostle John in glory sitting on one of them. But one of them elders said, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Well, he hasn't seen that happen yet. That starts happening in chapter number six. We start seeing what happens with all of them seals. What are you saying? One of them elders says, Hey, it's already happened. But he hadn't seen it yet. Now just bear with me. This doesn't have anything to do with the lesson we're talking about. The Apostle John is one of the elders in glory. He's already seen everything in the book of Revelation because he's already written it. The book's still sealed. And he says, weep not. The Lamb's opened the book. He loosed the seven seals. But the Apostle John, who's seen it for the first time, hadn't seen any of that yet. So how's the elder know that he's already opened it if he hadn't opened it yet? Because he's already seen it as John the first time. He says, don't worry about it, buddy. I've seen it. It ain't going to be okay. That's just me. I can't take chapter and verse on that, but that's just me. But he says, The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. 
And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, capital S, spirits of God. It, the Son, the Trinity. The Father sits on the throne, the Son, the Lamb, and then the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, God. The Son is adorned with what? Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. The Holy Ghost never testifies of Himself. He is only there to testify and to glorify, magnify, beautify, if you will, the Son of God. Came and took the book out of the to him that sat on the throne. Now, after he takes that book, there's a lot of worship going on. Praise, reverence for the fact that one came that could take the book out of the very hand of God Almighty. Well, who took it out of his hand? God Almighty. But there was someone that had met the qualifications that were set all the way back in the Alpha of time that he could loose those seven seals and open that book. He hadn't done it yet, but everybody knows when the Lamb showed up, he can do it. No doubt in their minds. They start worshiping as he shows up before he even opens the book. They say, he's the one that's worthy. It's evident about him. But this book, what is this book? Is it the book of life? Don't believe so. You say, why, Brother Jordan? Because the book of life has been open ever since Jesus went to the cross. And he's been writing people's names in it ever since. It is not a book that is sealed. Whosoever can call upon the name of the Lord. What is this book, Brother Jordan? Is it the book that man will be judged out of? No, that's called the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread, of, bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You want to know what man's going to be judged for before God? It's right here. Forever settled in heaven. Preserved. This is God's standard. This is where man will be judged. So what's this book that's sealed? This book that has seven seals on it. What's that mean? God wanted to keep it closed until a certain time in a certain place. God wanted it to be so that only God could open this book. The number seven. We just saw that the Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. This book has seven seals. After the seven seals open, there's going to be seven trumpets that sound out of glory. They've got the vials that are poured out upon the earth. All of them seven. Well, how many days did it take the Lord to make the earth? Six, and He rested on seven. Seven in your Bible is a picture of God's completion. That God set forth a plan and did it, as it would say in the book of Revelation, that God saw it and saw that it was good. Because He does all things well. But these seven seals, by the time they are opened, it represents a completion. Something that God had desired to happen, and it will happen. This book. We don't have time to get into what's in the book today. But we're going to look at these seven seals and get through as many of them as we can, if need to, circle back next week. But these seven seals, as each one of them is loosed, it is loosing God's judgment upon the earth. It is the world will be judged by, but each one of these seals keeps God's judgment for sin and iniquity and all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden on the first disobedience towards God. Ever since that day, because of God's mercy and God's grace and long-suffering and the fact that He loved man with an everlasting love, these seals have withheld God's holiness and God's righteousness and God's superiority from wreaking judgment upon the face of the earth. And as each and every one of these seals is loose, certain things happen down here. Now, 
are they going to happen the way that it said, I believe everything that happens is going to happen. But again, I've told you, the Apostle John saw it through the spiritual lens. At one point, he sees an angel being cast down towards the earth. I don't know that that's what it's going to look like on this side with carnal eyes. But I believe it's all going to happen. When's it going to happen? I don't know. But I believe it's going to happen. If we go to chapter number 6, it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and him that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. At one point, the first seal will be loosed, and you'll see on the earth one goes and unifies all. We know that, according to Daniel and his prophecy that it was revealed unto him, the Antichrist will unify everything on the face of the earth under a one world universal government. They've been striving to do it for a long time. That's why some of them use the term Catholic or universal to describe their religion. In order to do that, He's going to have to conquer some things. You cannot unify everything. They are divided by so many things. It will be a forced unification. Submit or die. Fall in line, or you won't be, you know, you just won't be around no more. I've seen and studied history in the horrors and atrocities that man has committed upon other man because they saw them as different. Differences, all those things happened when the Spirit of God was still had His presence on the earth. When the church is raptured out, the Holy Ghost is coming with us. Jesus promised that the Holy Ghost would come to who? The church. To be a comforter instead of Christ until we could be unified with Christ. But when the Holy Ghost comes with us after the rapture, man will be left to man's own devices without the presence of God upon the face of the earth for the first time in history. And under the leadership of the Antichrist, a great conquering is going to happen. Nations will be wiped off the face of the earth. Those that are seen as different and other and outcast, they will either fall in line and become a part or they're going to be subject to that bow a bow is a weapon that takes enemies out from afar in fact throughout much of history those that were archers were seen by other armies as cowards because they didn't want to get up face to face and fight I can assure you that the antichrist is a coward because I see what happens when Jesus shows up he don't want to fight. He just wants the crown. Then he's on a white horse. What's that symbolize? It's false purity. He claims to be the answer to all the world's problems. And there will be a prophet that prophesies all the great things that he will do. And for a time, it'll happen just like he says it's going to happen. That's when the world will see him as a man sitting upon a white horse who did what no other man could do and unified the whole world together. They'll be singing His praises. Then verse number 3, when He had opened the second seal, I heard a second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Power is given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth. You study that great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's called. Halfway through the tribulation period, a line's going to be crossed. Where God starts to prove that the one that said that he was the world savior is not the world savior. And peace will turn to destruction and war. And things that we can't even imagine on this side of glory are going to come crawling out of the bottomless pit called hell and wreak havoc upon this world. But when the second seal is 
loosed another horse red the color of wrath destruction the color of bloodshed so his power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword the first one conquered from a fall with a bow the second conquered by force great bloodshed what are they doing they're seeking those out that refuse the mark of the beast that refuse to be a part of the so called civilized people and they're hunting them through the woods they're seeking them out in caves they're trying to eradicate all evidence that there was ever anything else but what the antichrist said that's not so crazy. Man's been doing it ever since nation fought against nation. They would go in and they'd raise the temples and the libraries and the records of the people that came before them. When you really look at it, it is truly a miraculous work of God that this part right here in the Old Testament was preserved with how many times that Israel was conquered. God ensured that His Word made it through all of those instances. But this rider on a red horse is going to go with the sword. And he's going to get up close and personal and root out all those that are different. That ran to the wilderness. Purpose that they would rather live like what we would call today cavemen rather than fall under the subjugation of the Antichrist. They're evidence of the fact that there was something before the Antichrist. So this writer was given authority to go and to hunt them up close and personal. Eradicate them. Verse number 5, And when he opened the third seal, I saw a third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Black is always a des description or a representation of the fact that something's been corrupted. Though his sins be but black. If the blood be applied, what are we? We're white as snow. Black is always a symbol of something that was pure, but now has become corrupted, tainted. Well, this writer had a set of scales or balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny. And three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou art not the oil and the wine. What's this writer doing? He's going out and he's corrupting the food supply. Wheat is a picture of the high quality stuff. A measure was enough for you to feed yourself. And it says a penny. Well, in the Apostle John's day, a penny or a denarii, that was a token of a man's day's wages. When the black rider comes up, even though the Antichrist said that everything was going to be great and everybody was going to be taken care of and there weren't going to be any problems anymore, out of nowhere, God's going to take food from the face of the earth. And how rare is it going to be? We complain about $3 a gallon for gas. This is saying if you want the high quality food, you're going to have to work all day just for one measure for one meal barley which was the the name brand stuff back in this day it says three measures for a penny but what if you're the head of your household let's take the Schneckenbergers for instance brother Charlie's got himself Miss Sharon three children brother Charlie is saying you're going to work all day and your pay is only going to be able to provide three measures of barley who's going to miss out on the meal that day because there's only enough for three even though you worked all day it's going to be a time of great famine great struggle and yet through it all the antichrist is going to be saying I've got all the answers it'll be okay we'll make it through it and just as they start coming to term with rationing their food supply going hungry so that children might be able to have the food that they need to eat 
Can he imagine the theft and the chaos and the robbery? People are going to just trying to find enough food to give to those that they care about. Just as they're coming to terms with that. Verse number 7, when he had opened the fourth seal. This has nothing to do with Sunday school, but back when I used to play Call of Duty, my name tag was the fourth horseman. This is why. I thought I was cooler than I really was. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse. Pale or pallid. That color in the Bible always is associated. It doesn't say pure. It's not white. It's pale. In your Bible, that's always a picture of a sickly thing. You know what color leopards were? They were pale. They were pallid. Their skin was literally dying as it fell off of them. Wasn't healthy. Even today, if somebody doesn't look good, what do you say? You've lost your color. You look white as a ghost. That's the color of this horse. You can look at it and know there's nothing good that's associated with that horse. Then it says, and his name that sat on him was Death. Capital D. That's a true presence. In Egypt, when God said that he was going to send the death angel, I truly believe that death was something that had to be created because of man. What do you say? the Jordan I believe death is an entity because it's a capital D Christ came and because he got up on the third day now has the keys to what death and hell it was something that God had to create because of man's disobedience before the garden there was no death before Lucifer sinned there was no hell these are things that man has to deal with because of man's choices, not because of God's choices. Well, when that pale horse shows up, and as it begins to ride around the world, man has to come face to face with the fact that he is not immortal, that he is not invincible, that he is not able to control his own destiny. The only thing he's able to do is to be born and then to die. But it's not just death. It says the name of him that sat on the horse was death. And hell followed with him. Hell came right after death. Now again, that's a capital H. Hell. Hell is a place, but hell is also a thing. the end times the time of Jacob's trouble what we would call the end times it's going to be hell on earth not figuratively literally we think that well the church isn't going to be here if the Lord came back today, how many people you know that are going to live seven years? I dare say, a bunch of them. They may not make it through all of it, through the apocalypse. But there's going to be people that you know living and breathing today, I truly believe, that are going to be around when these four horsemen are loosed upon the world. And you know what that's going to be for them? It's going to be hell on earth. It's going to be death manifest everywhere that they are. Well, 
verse number 9, when he had opened the fifth seal. I saw along near the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And all of this that is going on, there's still people that are running from, still people that are fleeing the wrath of the Antichrist because they would not submit and when we get raptured out, this isn't going with you. You know how many copies of the Word of God have been printed throughout the years that are on nightstands and bookshelves and are hidden away in boxes in people's attics? And as people go on the lamb and they're running away from the wrath of the Antichrist, we know that they have to have never heard the gospel before, but they can find this book and through what they read in the book, they can believe that they don't need to become a part of what the Antichrist is doing. And they'll have to reject them. They'll have to find a way to either steal food or to f catch it out in the wilderness or to make a way that they can live on their own, but they're always going to be on the run. And until the day that the Antichrist catches up with them, they'll live in a constant state of fear and turmoil and panic. But because they believed what the Word of God said so much that they were willing to die for it, a white robe will be given unto them and they'll be counted among the believers. Because in every dispensation, God has a way for man to come to Him. Is it through the blood? Yep, but this time they had to shed their blood along with accepting the blood of Christ. They have to be willing to die for it. And you can see that they're mourning. They're painful. Lord, how much longer do we have to wait until you punish the ones that did the things to us? They're going to have to watch children burned at the stake as somebody recants, or petitions them to recant and take the mark of the beast. I've seen what happened during the Holocaust. I've read reports of the atrocities of ancient man as they went in and pillaged and plundered and raised cities. But again, all of that happened with God's hand still on the earth and man wasn't given over completely to man's own desires and devices. There's no telling what these people are going to have to suffer as a result of the fact that they didn't want to fall in line with the Antichrist. That fifth seal's open and they're given white robes. But he says, I can't loose the judgment yet. Because there's still a few that are just like you. And if I poured out my judgment right now, they wouldn't get in. Then, verse number 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains, And rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? I do truly believe that by the time we get to verse number 12 and that sixth seal is open, where's the Antichrist and all of his crowd that are going to be running to? The caves, the rocks, 
the deep places to where they can't bear to see the face of God, they go and hide themselves in the earth. Where do you think all them people that they were hunting and chasing, where do you think they were hiding out at? The same places that these people are going to be looking for to inhabit. I think by the time the sixth seal is open, all those that resisted the Antichrist except for Israel, they're going to be off the face of the map. Because once the sixth seal is open, you find the Antichrist and his crowd living in the places that they just removed people from. They emptied them out, and now they're having to live in them. Then, after these seals, we haven't even gotten to the seventh yet, but after these six, seven, and some things start to happen. We're not going to get into chapter number seven yet this week. But you know me, I don't like teaching on something just to teach on it. I believe that there's a spiritual implication for you and me out of this chapter today. God didn't just write this chapter of the Bible, have John record it after we had seen it, so that you could know what's going to happen in the future. God wrote it for you so that you'd have spiritual implication out of it today. Today's the day that the Lord hath made. God hadn't made the day yet that the rapture happens. But what's He give you? He gives you just a little glimpse. We just get a few sentences on each seal. But you know what these seals, again, every one of these seals looses a little bit of God's judgment upon the earth. You know how close heaven is? It's close enough that if you could see with spiritual eyes, you could look up and see it. But how can you say that, Brother Jordan? Because when that sixth seal was open, he rolled back the sky. And wherever you are on this earth, you could look up and see the face of a holy and righteous God. Heaven's a whole lot closer than you think it is. How close is heaven when you say the Lord? He says yes. How close are these events to happening? Well, we've already shown you all the prophetical things that have to happen, have happened except for the rapture. How close is one of your family members to going through all of these events? And how close are they to get the glory? About the width of the outstretched hands of the Savior. That's as far as they are away from heaven. How far are you willing to go to keep someone you've never met, may have never seen, may have never even had the occasion that you've thought about where this person lives in the world, but yet you care so much about their soul that you don't want them to go through these things? Hell's going to be an awful place. The Bible calls it outer darkness. It calls it a place where the flame is not quenched. The worm cannot die. I know the lake of fire is going to be worse. We don't get much description about what goes on in hell. We don't get much description about what's going on in the great tribulation. We don't get much description of what the lake of fire will be but you know what all of them have in common the Bible makes it very clear that you don't want to be a part of it how close are you to surrendering to do what God wants you to do to keep somebody from going through this God's God he can save whoever he wants whenever he wants to save them but God chooses to use people God didn't write this book of the Bible up in the sky. He gave it as a message to a man named John on the Isle of Patmos as he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day so that he could go back and tell other people what he saw so that they could, one, record it, two, pass it on to the next generation. And the reason you have what you have today is because people let themselves be used of God. How close are you? 
We already heard this week. You got to get closer before you can get higher. First thing you got to do is get closer to Him. But how close are you to the people that He wants you to reach? Heaven's close, friends. Eternity is not much farther away. Do you know how far eternity is away? One breath. We get so caught up in the day-to-day and the repetition and our programs and our routines. Is the world really going to see four men ride out of heaven on horses? I don't know that they'll see it, but I believe that God's going to let it happen. I believe that things are going to get so desperate. There was a time in, recorded in the history of your Bible that people got so desperate that they started offering up their own children as sacrifices to false gods to try and appease them. What do you think people are going to be willing to do once the presence of God has been removed by the world? I don't care who your worst enemy is. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. When we really put in perspective what's waiting for people, and when we really put into perspective the importance of you being willing to share with them, we haven't even gotten to the point yet where those that we were meant to shine a light for, to be the salt of the earth for, if we didn't live as God wanted us to live, their blood will be required at your hands. And that's before he wipes away all the tears from your eyes. You'll be broken hearted. They'll still be out, out excuse. But they're going to be able to point a finger at you and say they didn't do what they were supposed to. And because of it, God's going to say their blood's required at your hands. It's a sobering thought. But it ought to be a motivating thought. This isn't your judgment. We already dealt with the judgment seat of Christ. This is others' judgment. You do realize that because of Christ going to the cross, we didn't have to suffer the judgment that was due us. You know what the difference between you and judgment was? Christ. You know what the difference between somebody else and their judgment might be? You taking them Christ. Doesn't take much. All it takes is love, charity, compassion. All it takes is you taking a step back and realizing that all them things that used to be important to you aren't going to matter more than a pile of beans and not, you know, glory and eternity and everything else. What more noble, what more heavenly calling can you have on your life than to go and tell someone that doesn't know the greatest story that's ever been told? Then to tell them it's not just a tale, it's real. then to share that fellowship for all of glory knowing that they won't have to endure the things that are written in this book and as bad as some of them things are it's getting a whole lot worse in the next chapter in the chapter after in the chapter after that how bad does it get get so bad that the only way to end it is that the Lord comes back lands on the Mount of Olives splits it in half and has to start over for a thousand years he'll rule and reign it gets so bad that the only way to stop it is that God himself has to come and put an end to it how bad was it in Noah's day that the only way to stop it God had to come in put an end to it how bad was it in Sodom and Gomorrah that God had to show up and put an end to it And those were just inklings. 
brief moments of the wrath and the judgment of God. Imagine when God pours it out on the earth for the last time. Imagine when He pours it out fire and brimstone upon the earth and destroys it utterly and gives us new heaven and new earth. I don't know what it's going to be like. Hallelujah, I won't find out. But I do know that there's people, I truly believe there are people living and breathing today that are going to see those events firsthand with their own eyes. I'm not above believing that the Antichrist may be drawing breath on the earth right now. How close is it? Closer than you want to realize. John saw all these things and what did he say? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Be it I feel that there are so many sitting on church pews today on their way to heaven that they don't want them to come quickly because they've still got things they want to do. Lord, help us to get ready for what's to come. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.